Pastor Brock, you forgot your notes. I, I, won't re- I won't read them out loud what they say. All right, where you're sitting right now is the evidence of a promise fulfilled that almost wasn't. Where you're sitting right now is the evidence of a promise fulfilled that almost wasn't. And I say almost wasn't because uh, there was opposition, there was weakness, and there was surprise. Weakness, opposition, and surprise. Let me break this down for you. What what was the promise? What am I talking about? Well, uh, almost 25 years ago, um, our founding pastor, Lauren Van Woonenburg, which is a great Dutch last name, he sensed God's call and a promise along with 10 other people who were in a Bible study in Corona. We actually still have uh, two of those founders. Are the cooks here? No. Okay, maybe they're in the 9 a.m. Uh, we literally have a couple that were in this small group of 10 people of a Bible study in Corona that I'm talking about. And they felt God's calling, God's promise for there to be a church, not just in Chino or Eastville, but right here in the preserve. And at that time, you got to know 2001, none of, the pres- none of the preserve was developed. It was all dirt and dairy farms, and there's still one or two left. That was the promise. Now, what was the opposition? Well, the opposition was that they couldn't get land or a building. And so this promise of having a multicultural, a multi-ethnic community, a church in the preserve, they couldn't meet because there was nothing available for them to purchase or even just to meet in. And years go by, they move forward with this, but they they decide to hold their first Sunday service uh, at an elementary school in Ontario. And then a couple years later for that, they shift then the the Sunday meeting location for the bridge off Roswell Avenue. Um, If you know where like the Kaiser and the McDonald's is by the 71 this, and it's still there today, this, it's kind of like a, a, an industrial complex. That then is where the bridge met for years, right there at Roswell Avenue. Uh, God, but you, you called us, you promised us that you, you wanted a multi-ethnic, multicultural church in the Chino Preserve. Why are we on Roswell Avenue? God, where are you? What's up with that? We just got done meeting at the school in Ontario. Silence. From God. Years go by, and there ends up being a couple merges. Uh, the bridge ended up merging uh, with actually a church that helped start them called Oaks Community Church, which was in northern Chino. And then, because they merged together, then the bridge then met and finally had a physical facility for itself there on Oaks Avenue, northern Chino. It's all still there today. And then some weakness started. Um, It is very, very, very hard to have a multi-generational church. And when when those two churches merged, the bridge and Oaks, the bridge was full of young people with no money. Oaks, finances were great, but they had no young people. And so in some respects, it was a perfect match. But in other respects, it caused actually a lot of opposition and weakness because there's all these different preferences and styles. It's not easy to do. 2012, there's a Lutheran church called Mission Point that was actually very forward-thinking. They had great strategy, and they had purchased four acres of land right here in the Chino Preserve. They come into the preserve. They go to plant a church. They're met with opposition and weakness. And nothing on their own fault, but they just, they didn't end up making it, and they had to close their doors. Mission Point, this Lutheran church which had purchased four acres of land here in the preserve, they hadn't built on it yet, it was still dirt, and then they had to close. But somehow, someway, they came into contact with the bridge and they're like, hey, we want a church to be right here on this dirt. We'll give it to you if you promise to plant the church here in the preserve and you pay off all of our debt and we want to give our pastors a severance and just have everyone be blessed and let's move on. Well, The bridge ended up getting four acres of the land for pennies on the dollar, basically $250,000, and we got four acres of land right here. 
Now, that was just the beginning, 2012. Ooh, is this God's promise finally being fulfilled of a multicultural, multi-ethnic church community in the preserve? So 2016, the bridge sold off their land and their facility, Oaks, to another church, which actually still meets there today, then moved to Ontario Christian High School and temporarily met there on Sunday mornings. Uh, again, more opposition and, and, and weakness in the sense of, um, if you've ever been a part of a church that has to set up and tear down every Sunday, like people 5.30 in the morning, getting trailers, having to t- you know, bring in all the equipment, set it up, kids ministry, music, band. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's just a lot of labor. It's not easy. And then there was a lot of, of very natural grieving of having to leave a facility where decades of memories had been on Oaks Avenue. That's not easy. And then they had a lead pastor transition. That's not easy. Any church that goes through a lead pastor transition, it is extremely tough no matter what the reason is. And then I get here October 2018. um, We have this land that you're sitting on this dirt, not developed at all yet. And then within two or three months, I find out that we actually don't have enough money to finish the the build. But there had been um, a groundbreaking ceremony. And then I find out that, yeah, actually, we're about $1.5 million short. Wow. How's that for a first lead pastor gig? God, where are you at? Isn't this your promise? Don't you want us here? Isn't this your calling? Like, man, how come you're not making this happen for us? This is your will. And then finally, Fe- February 16, 2020, we move in here. And then something that maybe you've heard of, something like a global pandemic happens. And our grand opening was supposed to be March 29th, 2020, and that never happened. There was another surprise. Um, all these surprises other, the huge surprise of Mission Point giving this land to us was a positive surprise. The COVID was a negative surprise. And almost 25 years later from that original promise in 2001 for a multicultural, multi-ethnic church to be here with the campus in the Chino Preserve, that promise has now been fulfilled and we are debt-free on this building. <laughs> I say all of that, and I open with that very intentionally. Because here's the sentence that I want to leave you with this morning. God's normal pattern of promise keeping is opposition, weakness, and surprise. God's normal pattern of promise keeping is opposition, weakness, and surprise. Um, I would argue that actually the Bible is one giant story of a promise that is met with opposition, weakness, and surprise. Um, And so what we're doing this morning is, this is week two of this new series in Exodus. Exodus is the second book in the Old Testament. Genesis, of course, is first. Um, If you've missed last week, I'm absolutely building upon it, so go watch it on YouTube if you weren't here. But in the same way as last week, I'm going to have us hop into and start from Genesis. Genesis is the book of beginnings. Um, I shared last week in our introduction that Exodus is a direct part two, or chapter two, of Genesis. If Genesis is chapter one of the Bible, so to speak, then Exodus is chapter two. Exodus directly continues the story that's picked up in Genesis. And so I need to take us back there. I know it's confusing. I call this a series on Exodus, and then like the first two Sundays, we spend all this time in Genesis. But hey, they all go together. So turn with me, Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three. Um, If you need a Bible this morning, as is always the case, these are available for you, and you can take them home for free. Genesis 12, page 8. Um, Genesis 12 is a really, every chapter in the Bible is important, but Genesis 12 is like really important because something shifts. Genesis 3 to 11 
it is all about sin uh, and the fall and how wickedness multiplies. And it's kind of like, what is Yahweh, the God of the Bible, what is he going to do about the problem of Genesis 3 to 11? Well, Genesis 12 is the answer to the problem of Genesis 3 to 11. And so the story begins to shift. The story turns and God gives a promise in Genesis 12 that is to provide a solution to all the problems of the world, the problem of sin and death. And here's what's crazy. This promise appears absolutely bonkers. And I just, can you just, I love saying the word bonkers. It's a fun word to say Genesis 12, if there's something that's bonkers, it's the promise given in Genesis 12. It just seems crazy. Here's what it is. God's talking to Abram. Later, his name changes to Abraham. Genesis 12, 1. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, And whoever curses you, I will curse. And here's the the cliffhanger. Underline this. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That last part is the key. All peoples of earth will be blessed through you. So God's plan, God's promise is to fix and restore and redeem this world. Check this out. Through Abraham's offspring, meaning the primary way that God rescues us and fixes this world is through a partnership with human beings. That is crazy. Like if I was God, that would not be the plan that I would come up with because humans are messy. But this is why the nation of Israel is so important in the Old Testament because the nation of Israel is, they're the offspring and the descendants of Abraham. They're the people that God is supposed to redeem this world through. That is the point of Israel. And Exodus is the story of how this nation is formed and freed out of enslavement from Egypt and they become their own nation. It is through Israel that God will redeem, restore, and bless this fallen world. Now, go three chapters to the right from Genesis 12 to Genesis 15 and that promise that God makes with Abraham that through his descendants, the world will be blessed. Um, It's formalized. Uh, Think about We have contracts today. It's almost like Genesis 15 is a contract. Uh, The biblical word for this is covenant. And we don't use that word too much today outside of maybe like wedding vows. But it's very similar to that. This is God's promise, his covenant, his contract that he is going to do this. And this is the backdrop to the formation of the Hebrews that then we read about in Exodus Genesis 15, verse 13. We read this last week. I want to take us back to it. Then the Lord said to him, Abraham, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. That's the Exodus, Egypt. Verse 14, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. That's the Exodus. They will be set free from Egypt. Skip to verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. He made a promise with Abram. And he said this, to your descendants, I give this land. And then he goes on and he um, gives all the geography of it. And the land that he says, hey, I'll give you guys this land. That's the promised land or the land of Canaan or what is today the land of Israel. Now, With all of that in mind, this promise made to Abraham that he'll free this people out of Egypt and bring them back to the promised land. Go with me back now to Exodus chapter one where we left off last week. So we looked at Israel is growing. They're multiplying. The Egyptian Pharaoh doesn't like this. It makes him insecure. And so he tries now to start oppressing this people. He wants to shrink them. And so he, he puts them as slaves. He puts them into harsh labor out in the sun making bricks. 
we pick up the story, verse 15, chapter 1. The king of Egypt, or the Pharaoh, said to the Hebrew midwives, think of midwives as, you know, RNs, OBGYNs, so forth. Oh, who is that? Okay, let's go. That's right. We can clap for her. Come on, let's clap. If we ever got to deliver a baby in here, no pressure. (laughs) All right. Uh, Okay, so the midwives, verse 15, their names were Shipra and Pua. When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that a baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And then the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, he summoned the midwives and he asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, this is just kind of a funny verse to me too. Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous and they give birth before the midwives arrive. So I don't know. Rachel, our third kid came out pretty quick. Maybe Rachel's got some Hebrew in her. But apparently Hebrew women, they're just like popping out babies here. So God was, God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. Remember that theme there. They're multiplying, they're growing. Verse 21. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. And then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born You must throw into the Nile River, but let every girl live. Stop. Do you see the amount of opposition coming up against the people of God here? Quick review. First, as we saw last week, the new Egyptian pharaoh, he decides to enslave all the Israelite men. He forces them to work ruthlessly out in the hot sun, making bricks to build his pyramids with straw. Why? Simply because he wanted to decimate them and he didn't want them growing and multiplying as a nation. They were a threat to him and his Egyptian dynasty. And then, even after enslaving them with forced labor, he does a second thing of opposition. He tells the two midwives in charge of all of the births, apparently, he says, hey, if a boy is born, kill it. So now he's going after killing them. Now you're asking, okay, why, why killing boys? Well, the, the, the thought there for the Pharaoh, at least, is, well, these are future fathers and warriors, And so I want to decimate them and not have them be able to overtake us. And we would say kind of like a a helicopter view what's going on here is that there is an enemy and opposer who's wanting to oppose God's promise to develop a people who will then bless the world. He's getting in the way of that and he's saying, no, I don't want that to happen. And so if, if slavery is not enough and if having midwives kill baby boys is not enough, He goes for even more opposition, verse 22. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. He originally just says it to the midwives. And now he just tells everyone, throw all the Hebrew boys into the Nile River. Brothers and sisters, I want to awaken you to the sobering reality that God's promises are consistently opposed. Oh, follow Jesus, give your life to him, be a part of the church, the people of God, and you'll live happily ever after. No. That one's actually not in the Bible, unfortunately. Actually, the picture painted all throughout the scriptures, it's the melody and the rhythm given, right? We talked about melody and rhythm last week, is that consistently, actually, if you are part of God's people, or as Jesus said, if you follow me, pick up your cross. There is always usually opposition to God's promises being fulfilled. And I think this is really helpful to know because I think a lot of Christians, sometimes I think we are shocked or surprised when hard things happen to us, right? Sometimes I think we're naive and that we think 
following Jesus or being a part of his family and his people, that everything will be easy and happily ever after when actually the scriptures beginning in the Old Testament very clearly in Exodus say, no, actually, you will be opposed. Now, to be clear, because I think this is common sense, but we we just got to say it. We have a tendency to go to the extreme on everything in our culture today. This doesn't mean, I'm not saying that if anything bad happens to you, it's satanic opposition. Because sometimes, oh man, something just happened to me, oh, this must be Satan. Eh, maybe, but maybe not. Example, if you're taking a test and you don't study for it, you take the test, week goes by, you get it back and it says F, I don't think that's satanic opposition. I think that's human error and a lack of responsibility. <laughs> We get it, right? So there, there's multiple things that we can apply this to. Uh, it, it just pet people like Christians, oh, this must be Satan. Well, it could be, but God also entrusts us to be responsible and good stewards. So, but here's my point. If you are walking in God's plan for your life and you are actively pursuing the promise of God being fulfilled in your life, then I wouldn't be surprised if you faced opposition in that. Why? Because just like in the Egyptian story at the Exodus, there is a powerful being who opposes God's promise being fulfilled in your life. And actually, this is going to sound so weird, but I mean this as, as encouragement and to strengthen your faith. Why? Because let me tell you something. There is a powerful spiritual being. We talked about this in our God at War series beginning of the year. Is he going to mess with someone who isn't going about the father's business? No! Will he mess with those who are walking in God's promises? Oh, yeah. So in kind of a backhanded way, it's actually, and it sounds weird to say, but maybe encouraging or complimenting if you're facing opposition because you are chasing after the king of the universe. And so I just want to ask you this morning, are you facing opposition because of God's promise and calling on your life. And if so, be encouraged and strengthen your face because God's normal pattern of promise keeping is opposition. We just see it over and over in the scriptures. Um, Pastor David Murray, who wrote a devotional book on Exodus, says this, God's promises will be battered, but they'll never be broken. God's promises will be battered. I don't know if some of us are aware of that, but they will be battered, but they will never be broken. Now, you would expect at this moment in Exodus 1, Pharaoh's got all this opposition going. Oh, we know what's going to happen now in the plot. This is how Hollywood movies work. Something bad happens, and then what's the next part of any good, well-written movie or book? This superhero figure rises to the scene, and he takes over and delivers the people. Yeah, sometimes, but not here. And actually, not usually in the Bible. Again, as Murray puts, God uses weak people to fulfill his strong promises. God uses weak people to fulfill his strong promises. Let me talk to you about midwives. Midwives, 3,000 years ago in ancient Egyptian culture, were socially weak people. For a number of reasons, we think. One, they were females in a male patriarchal society. And I say that unfortunately, but that was the case back then. So they were off to a bad start simply because of their gender, unfortunately. But also, because they were midwives, many scholars wonder this, they probably struggled with infertility and were unable to get pregnant, and that is why they were a midwife. And you have to know in the ancient culture, to struggle with infertility and not have kids was probably the most socially embarrassing thing to deal with. Because you being able to pass things on to your descendants was everything. And so we actually think that midwives were basically low-income socially ostracized, socially weak people. But God. Do you notice something there? 
People glance over this. Did you notice that the personal specific names are mentioned of these two Hebrew midwives? And then check this out. This is cool. Nowhere in Exodus is Pharaoh's name mentioned. And this actually poses a really big problem for scholars. Scholars fight over this because Exodus doesn't tell us who the Pharaoh is. And so some people say, oh, it's Ramses, and there's all these different opinions. But I think they missed a point on it because the point, the Bible, I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Don't get me wrong. But even if you don't, it is at minimum brilliant literature. Because the author is doing something so intentional and beautiful here. He is giving the names of weak, unlikely heroes. And then he's not naming on purpose the most powerful man alive at that time. Do you see that? And the evidence is that, is that still to this day, 3,000 years later, we are talking about Shipra and Pua. The author is highlighting for us the unlikely so-called weak people who are God's unlikely heroes. Um, Exodus commentator Christopher Wright puts it best. In the midst of the great matters of state, of government policies and edicts, of imperial building projects that will stand for millennia, he's talking about the pyramids. You can go see them today in Egypt. Who are the heroes of the first chapter? Two otherwise unknown women who feared God and saved the lives of an unknown number of little sons of Israel. For time and again, it is the little people, the unsung people, the most unlikely people, whom God chooses to use as his agents and carrying forward his purposes. The God of Moses is also the God of Shipra and Pura and our God still. Are you here this morning and you feel weak and you feel like God can't use you? Mark, you don't know my story. God would never use you. Are you kidding me? You're exactly the one that he wants to use. The everyday, seemingly little ordinary decisions of teachers, of janitors, of baristas, of small business owners, of truck drivers, of students, are the very agents who God wants to use to fulfill his promises here now. And it's your name that will be remembered in the Lamb's book of life and not the so-called pharaohs of this world. See, God's normal pattern of promise keeping, it comes with opposition he always uses weak people, and what's the third element? Surprise, surprise. See, God loves surprise parties. Some of us don't, but he does. Let's go back to the text. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married to a Levite woman. Why Levites? We'll get into this later in the series, but Levites end up becoming uh, the priests of Israel. and So this person is coming from a priestly tribe. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And then Pharaoh's daughter, by the way, this is the same Pharaoh's daughter where her dad is telling, is murdering everyone went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it, saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, and just notice I mean, the irony dripping here, just brilliant literature. Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. Woo! So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him and now we are introduced to the main character of Exodus other than God, Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. That is actually what the name Moses means. All right. You have, I mean, we are so used to this story if you grew up in the church. 
Now, if you didn't, you actually have an advantage in reading this because I think you're not sanitized to it. You get how shocking this is. You get how surprising this is. Here you have Moses, who becomes the great prophet of the Jewish faith. And he is chosen and saved as a baby boy. And his mom decides to put him in a basket and send him down the Nile River, where all the baby boys are supposed to go to get killed because of Pharaoh's edict. And he's out there in the basket. And then Pharaoh, the murderer, his daughter happens to be out there, sees this basket. Oh, hey, guys, can you go look at that? I'm curious about it. Oh, my gosh, this is a beautiful Hebrew boy. Let's save him. Oh, but you know what? Let's have his mom take care of him and nurse him. And not just take care of him and nurse him, but I'll actually pay her to do so. Now she's actually better off. She just have to nurse him. And now she's going to pay to nurse her own son. And then years later, she gives him back. And of course, that was tough. But then the probe is that Moses then gets this royal education and is treated as a prince when he otherwise wouldn't have been. This is the most astonishing story of reversal. You can't make this stuff up. As Murray puts, the river of death becomes a river of life. And the murderous king's daughter became the savior of the king of king's son. Brothers and sisters, God's promises are often fulfilled in the most surprising ways. And I just want to ask you, are you aware of, are you open to that? Do you, meaning, do you look and expect, like, it's almost like, do you stand on your tippy toes everywhere you go, just looking for God to surprise you with something? And the thing is, when you live your life on your tippy toes for Jesus Christ, you live with your eyes wide open that every second of your life, every minute, every day, any location, any situation with anybody knowing that God can make the impossible possible. That's the surprise. It's a reversal. It's actually getting paid to nurse your own kid. Now, would someone do that for us? Anyways, 9 a.m. didn't get that. I just thought about that. You know what's the most staggering dynamic of the first two chapters of, of Exodus? Nobody gets this. In the first two chapters of Exodus, where it's all about God's promise being met with opposition and weakness and now surprise, a Jewish, we don't get this, but a Jewish person reading this At the time, they'd be like, God, where are you? Hello, God, are you there? We're growing, but now we got this Egyptian dynasty suppressing us, and not just suppressing us, they're killing our baby boys. Hello, God, are you paying attention? Silence. That's the way it would feel. Have you ever felt that way? God's got a call in your life, a promise on your life. And you just hear crickets. In these moments, it feels like God is behind the scenes. But did you notice how chapter two ends? The God who appears silent and absent has actually been there the whole time. And he's listening. And he understands you. And he has compassion on you and your whole situation. What do I mean? Verses 23 through 25. Man, this is beautiful. During that long period, let me just, long period. I mean, we're talking decades, hundreds of years. It's not like Israel was enslaved for two months. The king of Egypt dies. Bless you. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and here it is. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Isaac and Jacob are Abraham's son and grandson. Verse 25, so God looked on the Israelites, and he was concerned about them. Remember I had you turn to you, and you probably didn't understand why, Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 in the beginning, because there's this seemingly random promise to a guy named Abraham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, God shows up on the scene, end of chapter two, 
God hasn't been mentioned at all in chapter one and two. There's that part with the midwives about them fearing God, but that's, that's them talking about God. It's not him being active. And it's just like, God, where are you in this? Your people are being oppressed. God seems quiet, absence away. Oh, no, he's not. He's got his promise with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and the Israelites front and center. It's almost like there's a curtain up on the stage and he's right behind the curtain and he's actually directing the whole thing. You just can't see him. He hasn't forgotten the promise. Though God's name may not be mentioned until the end of chapter two, oh, he's been working, listening, and staying faithful to his promise the whole time in the midst of opposition, using weak people in surprising ways to fulfill his covenant promises. All right, Mark, that's great biblical, literary, genius stuff of God, but man, what about my life today? Like, give me like flesh and blowns, a modern day example of this. I got you. Uh, when I was writing this a couple days ago, immediately struck, in a lot of ways, I would say my wife's story, Rachel, has very similar dynamics to this melody. Opposition, weakness, surprise. And so rather than just me telling it, um, Rachel's just, she's gonna come up right now. I figure it'd be better for her to tell it than me, plus she's just more interesting than I am. Um, so Rachel, why don't you go ahead and you just preach for us. Take this away. First of all, I'm not more interesting than you, but thank you. Um, yeah, I wanna share a little facet of my life, and this isn't like... Um, you know, a huge life or death circumstance, it's a small thing, it's a dream, it's a call, but I also think that God cares a lot about those things, about our lives too, so I hope this encourages you. When I was in elementary school, I started to have um, this gravitation towards, like, news reporting, and I, f I sensed at that young of an age... Um, kind of how God had wired me to tell people stories. I was just drawn to them. I loved communication, um, writing, speaking, things like that. I actually wrote out newscasts, like when I learned how to write, like this is the six o'clock news and my mom saved them. Like, I don't know a little kid that does that, but anyway. It led me to study uh, journalism. I got my bachelor's in journalism and started working in um, TV and news and I thought, you know, this is what God's called me to do. I'm, I'm walking in the promise that he has for my life. And uh, at that time, I got an idea for the first book that I wanted to write. I took a move. I moved up north um, out of California to follow a really promising job lead as a reporter. And while I was up there in another state, which will remain unnamed for um, other reasons, um, <laughs> I competed in a pageant. I won, and I ended up winning the state pageant, and I was going to get to go compete at Miss America. This was like a dream come true for me. But also, I felt like the pieces to God's promise were kind of falling into place for me. Because I thought, once I get this visibility, and I kind of um, you know, get a bit of a platform to stand on, then I'm going to be able to write a book. And then people will want to you know, listen to what I have to say. And that's going to open the doors for me to be a reporter. And everything that I had dreamed about was going to fall into place. I thought, this is how God's promise is aligning for my life. And everything changed in about a week's time. One day I was driving to work and um, I parked my car and an investigative reporter knocked on my window and she had a cameraman right in my face. And, and it wasn't like one of those warm, fuzzy feelings you get like, oh, I'm going to be on the news. It, it wasn't that kind of thing. And I uh, rolled down my window and she said, I'm following an anonymous lead that you haven't lived in this state long enough to represent it at Miss America. And I thought, Okay, um, well, this should be a non-issue because I've been cleared to compete at the preliminary pageant and the state pageant. Like, I don't know what this is about. I thought this was just going to blow over. Slow news week. Well, I was wrong. She ends up airing this piece about me on the, on the 11 o'clock news that night at the CBS station up there and just smearing my name, painting it out like I had this agenda to move up from California and steal this opportunity from one of their homegrown native girls in the state. I'm not even from California, but I just went to school here. Other stations picked this up, and within a week, um, my name had just gotten smeared to the mud and the internet in every way possible. I was only 24. Reporters were outside my driveway. I was scared at times, too. And attorneys got involved from Samarica. My dad hired one. And I 
could not believe what was just spinning. It was like my life did a 180. And I ended up leaving. I had to give up my title. I couldn't compete at Miss America. And the very doors that I thought were going to open to be a reporter were shut by reporters themselves. So I moved back down here to California. I moved in with my mom in an apartment. She and my dad had just recently divorced. Things were tight. Um, and I did not know what to do with my life because I felt I had heard God so clearly, and this was the path that he had for me, and now the doors were shut, and where am I supposed to go from here? So I start waiting tables at the Cheesecake Factory, and it, I entered that season after the opposition where it just felt like God was quiet for a long time. I didn't know what direction to go, so I just kept showing up for work. I say, okay, God, I'm going to do what's right in front of me as best as I can store away my money, because little did I know, a couple years later, I'd be buying my fiancé tickets to see Les Mis. If you were here last week, you understand what a great investment that was. Um, then one day, I, I sensed God broke his silence, and he said, no, no, Rachel, you didn't mishear me. I just want to redirect that call. I want you to tell my news. And that felt like a call to ministry for me, and it was so clear to me that I actually, I wrote it down in this Butterfly Journal, it was 2012, people, give me a break. I wrote it down on the front page of this journal because I needed to keep a reminder of God's promise in front of me every day because what I was waking up to do day in and day out was so far away from this. I thought, if I don't keep this in front of me, I'm going to lose faith in the whole thing. And I think I also wanted to test God and see if he was going to come through for me. I still really wanted to write as the years went on, but I just felt like my life was accumulating like more losses and I was going more into obscurity and I thought, who's going to publish it? Like, I'm a no-name. And um, I met Mark in seminary. We got married, got pregnant with our first child and our first baby died um, to miscarriage. And that season of weakness in my life, weakness in my faith, that's the weakest it's ever been, full of doubt for God, I never imagined that God would use that chapter of weakness to later tell a story of his faithfulness. Last August, after 11 years, after I wrote down that promise I sensed from God in the front of this book, it's actually the same book that I outlined chapters of a book that got published last August. And... Yes, thank you, Lord, and his faithfulness. I just want to encourage you that it's exactly as Mark's saying, this theme through scripture. I'm a real walking example of the fact that when a promise seems so far and all you're met with is opposition and your life is accruing more and more weaknesses and you seem further and further away from the thing that God has promised or you sense he's promised for your life, we don't know how he's orchestrating things behind the scenes. And that's what he did for me. The more obscure I got and the, the more weakness my life accumulated, I was actually getting closer to the fulfillment of his promise. And now I just think it's so cool how God works. Um, one of the weakest areas of my faith and seasons of my life, he used to now publish something that is encouraging women who have just lost a child and are probably in the weakest part of their faith too. Um, that points to the hope of Jesus. So that's just a bit of my story. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Rachel. I want to end with this. It's always about Jesus. Here's the good news of Jesus. God didn't just make a promise to you and then stand off to the side. Aloof. All right, you can go figure it out yourself now. Go at it. That, that's not the way God works. God is so committed to fulfilling his promise in your life, just as he was to Rachel, that he actually wrote himself into the story. And in Jesus, God faced the biggest opposition in Satan and death. He became the weakest anybody could ever become on a first century humiliating Roman cross. And he acted then in the most surprising way by reversing death through that weakness. Why? All to ultimately fulfill his promise to Abraham that he is going to bless and redeem this world through people. And that, that is why. Am I off? 
Okay. No, oh, that was a moment killer. That is why you can trust him. You can trust him and be encouraged by him because the evidence of the way that he keeps his promises is on the cross. That is where opposition and weakness and surprise met in their climax and showed and showcased God's love for you. Um, David Murray put it best, so I'll end with this. That's the pattern we see repeatedly in the Old Testament. But nowhere do we see it more clearly than in God's climactic story of Jesus. God kept his promises in the most surprising way and the birth of Jesus to a poor family. God's promise was so opposed that it culminated in Jesus' murder. But Jesus defeated all opposition through the weakness of death. And then he used weak disciples to fulfill his promise in the New Testament church. Surprise, opposition, and weakness is God's promise pattern. And this story can become your story too. See, God isn't just a promise maker. He's the promise keeper. Even when you don't feel him or sense him. He's the grand architect. He's behind the scene, putting the thing together actually in a far better way than you can imagine. I just want to invite you to stand now we're going to sing a song that you guys know. But sing this not just to the promise maker, but to the promise keeper, the God who has put it all on the line for you. And you may not see him, you may not feel him, you may not hear him, but you can trust him. We'll have a prayer team up here. If you need prayer for anything this morning, something that's been said all throughout this morning is there's just a sense of God healing. And so we want to open ourselves up and be obedient to that invitation. Do you need healing for anything this morning? Just come forward, receive prayer. Let's worship him. Come, Holy Spirit.